Uh, welcome all to this event run by the Indigenous Studies Discussion Group, or ISDG, at the University of Cambridge. Uh, thank you for joining us today. This is our first event of the academic year, and we're very excited for many, many interesting panels and discussions, which we hope to facilitate through this platform. Um, we are grateful to the Center for Research in the Arts, Social Sciences, and Humanities, and the Cambridge Heritage Research Center for their support of this group and for making this event possible. The ISDG is a graduate student-led initiative started in 2019 with the objectives of one, promoting scholarship by and about Indigenous peoples across disciplines and spaces to be a regular feature of the intellectual life of Cambridge, and two, promoting and sharing the discussion of insights and ideas pertaining to Indigenous studies across peoples, disciplines, times, and geographies. My name is Christos Nicolaou, and I am a second year PhD student at the Department of Archaeology at the University of Cambridge. Um, my PhD focuses on the distribution of religious artifacts in urban contexts in the Hellenistic Far East and how that pertains to um, ideas of hybridity, especially in the realm of religion. Um, we are very excited today. Uh, we, have a we have a term long theme called Discovering Britain Through Discourses of Indigeneity. And we are excited for the first part of our conference of, sorry, of uh, for, for the first panel, which is which will concern the pre-British Empire period, um, from the Cheddarman to the early to the late medieval period. British history is rife with change. Ethnic, social, and linguistic shifts have indelibly marked its present day. While discourses of, of native or original Britons in popular media are nothing new, with the surge in topics of indigeneity across disciplines. Some scholars have begun to apply Indigenous studies theoretical frameworks to understanding different contexts, including British history. Such frameworks are a rather recent development and have drawn both interest and critique. Our panel aims to unpack some of these approaches through discussion on pre-imperial pre Britain from the Cheddarman to the medieval age. Our speakers will cover various topics from periods of pre-modern Britain and participate in a fruitful discussion on the utility and validity of these frameworks in the pre-Empire British context. And I will introduce our panelists. Uh, Professor Alex Wolf is senior lecturer in the School of History in the University of Glasgow. His main interests lie in the history of Britain and Ireland before the coming of the Romans, of the, of the Normans, uh, with a bias towards the earlier part of the period, circa 400 to 900 BCE. Particular interests include ethnic interaction and language shift, the development of political structures, and social and economic history. Further of these islands, he has less well-developed interest in late Roman and early post-Roman Gaul and in Scandinavia in the first millennium CE. Uh, Dr. Thomas Booth is a postdoctoral research fellow at Harvard University. He is currently wor working as a postdoctoral research associate on the Welcome Funder project, Human Adaptation to Diet and Infectious Disease Loads from the Origins of Agriculture to the Present. His own research is concerned with a microstructural analysis of diagenesis in ancient human bone, particularly the relationship between bioerosion and early postmodern taphonomic processes. Uh, this research also has applications to survival of DNA in ancient bone. And Dr. Ben Guy is a research associate in the School of Welsh at Cardiff University. He specializes in the language, literature, and history of medieval Wales. His interests range across early Welsh poetry, historical writing, and manuscripts, as well as early insular history. He also has a special interest in medieval Welsh texts that convey contemporary political views through representations of the Welsh past. He has conducted extensive research on the tradition of Welsh genealogical writing from the early medieval to the early modern period, and this is the subject of his monograph. He's currently a research associate working on the earliest poems of the Welsh Merlin tradition. And before we begin, we would like to offer some housekeeping notes. Um, Please keep your microphone turned off. The event will be recorded, so please keep that in mind and keep your cameras on and off as you prefer. By remaining in the room as we record the meeting, you consent to be recorded. The recording will be available on the Crash website and on the ISDG YouTube channel soon after the event. During the Q&A, if you would like to ask a question, please use the chat function to send a message to the general chat or to me and we will read it aloud. If you want to ask your question in person, please indicate that in the chat. Um, captioning has been enabled for this event. If you would like to ha have captioning, you can select it at the bottom of your screen. Uh, please note the captions are provided by Zoom and Crash cannot be held responsible for the accuracy. Uh, rest assured, you, you will be able to revisit the event recording on YouTube. We are doing our best um, 
to provide an inclusive uh, an inclusive environment in this online event. It goes without saying that all attendees are expected to show respect uh, and courtesy to the speakers and each other throughout the event. And I think it's a great time for me to leave it to our panelists to start their engaging discussion. Um, we will start through uh, historically chronological order. So I believe um, um, uh, Thomas Booth will go first. So take it away, Thomas. Okay. So um, as it says on here, I'm actually now at the Francis Crick Institute. I was, but I can understand why um, it came up as me still being with the NHM and Harvard because uh, they still haven't taken down my <laughs> profile on there. So um, uh, I'm still up there, and that's the most prominent thing that comes up when you Google my name. But yes, anyway, I'm at the Francis Crick Institute now working on a, an ancient DNA project that's looking to produce 10,000 um, ancient, G uh, sorry, 10,000, 1,000 ancient genomes from uh, across uh, prehistory and history in Britain covering the last 10,000 years to look at ancestry change and selection. And when I was asked to do this, uh, you know, I thought about what I could talk about. And really in, in terms of the discourse around ancient DNA, um, the idea of indigeneity, in, indigeneity, in, uh, in, indigeneity in Britain specifically um, is quite problematic in the way that it is utilised by the far right. So I thought this in terms of the way that they take uh, uh, sort of uh, the discourse around uh, indigenous uh, peoples in various parts of the world and try to um, use that to promote a far right sort of uh, white exceptionalist agenda in um, in uh, Britain, um, and how the ancient DNA results are trying uh, they try to co-opt ancient DNA results into that. So to begin with, I'll hopefully let's see if I can play this video, which gives term a, indigenous, a sense of what I'm all, talking about. There was an ice age here. There were no people here in the ice age because they couldn't live in the ice. Let's not go too far. Uh, <laughs> Tony, let's not go too no, far back. No, listen. We'll be here all night this if is, you start in the ice age. David, this, no, they, uh, Nick Griffin calls his party for indigenous ice age. Am I wrong? The people largely descended. All right, okay. Here. When the right. ice melted. Okay, when the ice melted, melted. 17,000 years ago, That's people good. came up from... OK, that was the main part that uh, I wanted to highlight. So this was uh, an appearance by uh, Nick Griffin, on, uh, who was then the leader of the far right British National Party on um, uh, Question Time, where he was making this explicit, uh, explicit association between um, the indigenous peoples of Britain uh, and being descended from people who first colonised Britain at the, or settled Britain at the end of uh, the last Iron Age. Uh, and the point was then, and, and now to some extent, uh, he's using this language and discourse around indigeneity in colonial con context and, and appropriating it to, uh, and combining it with, with DNA analysis, which at the time did suggest, it, it was very weak DNA analysis, but the DNA analysis that was there did suggest that um, uh, populations typical of Britain were descended from those who, uh, first migrated to Britain at the end of the last ice age around uh, um, 18,000 years ago. Um, but he was using this in a way that uh, um, sort of uh, de defining the, the, the British population as being this genetically definable, coherent whole that was under threat and should be afforded special rights um, in, this, in using the similar sort of languages that, that uh, are used about genuine indigenous peoples. Um, and I, I think this sort of uh, represents a blurring of, of the various different uh, possible definitions of, of indigeneity. You know, you've got, a, you've got a biological sense of indigeneity, which is essentially where a species evolved, which in this case for humans would be Africa. It's sort of co a colloquial understanding of um, indigeneity, which has its problems of people who have some kind of predominant continuous legacy in a particular place, but not always such as, for instance, in the Sami in Fenoscandia, who in terms of their uh, presence in, in Fenoscandia have been there for as long as people, uh, uh, um, sort of people uh, more, more typical, uh, that who are typically, uh, most typically Scandinavian. Um, and uh, the blend, the, the way that these all are all blended together to, to form an idea of the indigenous British with a with a genetic underpinning that it is about uh, the genetics, which is the way of defining uh, 
indigenous British people. Um, but it's important to say, it's important to, to sort of go, to go back to the fact that um, indigenous people's views of DNA and the way it defines peoples are highly uh, variable. Um, and particularly, you know, it, it, it's variable, but often it doesn't um, come into their definition of, of who and who isn't uh, indigenous. Um, and principally, Kim Tolbert in um, North America has uh, a native researcher in North America has hit out about the idea that um, DNA is not a principal or primary way of defining who is indigenous in, in, in North America. And that there are many people in North America who carry genetic ancestries derived from indigenous Americans, but are not um, indigenous American. And um, uh, the, the most obvious example of that is the sort of furore over Elizabeth Warren um, sort of calling herself Native American just because she had um, some uh, DNA derived from indigenous American groups. And similarly, genetics should have no role, it should be stated sort of from the outset, no role in uh, defining identity, indigeneity and, and rights in modern Britain. Um, so, so since, since that, uh, that clip I uh, showed, there's been a revolution in uh, archaeogenetics, the study of ancient DNA from humans, and we, we now have a much better idea and we have much more powerful techniques in which we can look at the DNA of uh, ancient people. And we have a pretty good idea of uh, genetic, the genetic history of Britain through prehistory. Um, so there's a there's a paper that's actually not out yet. So I'm giving you a slight sneak preview that, that will be coming out in the next few months, um, looking at uh, populations who inhabited Britain during the uh, during just after the last ice age, so from around uh, 16,000 uh, BC when Britain was still connected to continental Europe, and um, Britain was inhabited by groups that had this particular type of uh, genetic ancestry, sometimes called Goya Q2 ancestry. Goya Q2 is, is the site where you get the earliest um, type of this genetic ancestry appear. Um, and these are these genetic ancestors relatively distant from those who people live in Britain and Europe today. So um, this population who inhabit Britain here essentially doesn't exist um, anymore because of later genetic changes. Um, during the course of the Upper Paleolithic, um, there was uh, migrations into Britain, which largely um, replaced uh, the people who had been living there uh, previously, introducing these genetic ancestries known as Western Hunter Gatherer or Villa Brunia um, ancestries. And these are the populations that, that they probably abandoned Britain during the Younger Dryas when there was a return to glacial conditions, but then uh, returned to it and reoccupy it during the um, uh, uh, from the beginning of the Holocene uh, to around 4000 BC. So you can see this. These uh, proportions on the right hand side are reflecting different different types of these ancestries. So the Goya Q2 ancestry is common from this site, Goff's Cave, which is around uh, from around 12,000 BC. And then Kendrick's Cave from around 11,000 BC, you can see it totally shifts to this Villa Brunia genetic ancestries, which then persists. And then the rest of these burials in chronological order all the way through to around uh, 7,000 um, uh, BC. So you can see that there's a, a, a big shift in ancestries. But again, this new population that arrives, and this is the population that Cheraman belongs to, these Western European hunter-gatherers, are, gen are still genetically quite distant from populations who typically inhabit Britain uh, today. Going to Cheraman specifically, so this was a, a man that uh, died around 8,300 BC and was buried in Goff's Cave in Chergorj, Somerset. So when uh, we look at the uh, uh, pigmentation genetics in the way that uh, genetic variants linked to pig pigmentation vary amongst world populations and sort of use that to predict this, uh, the pigmentation of Cheddar Man, he comes back as having a uh, dark, it's quite wide range of dark to very dark skin pigmentation, dark brown or black hair and blue uh, green eyes. And this is similar to other Mesolithic populations of Europe. Um, essentially, uh, most of the populations that were inhabiting Western Europe at the time had similar pigmentation genetics and suggesting that they would have had dark skin, but potentially light colored um, eyes. Uh, and this is backed up by, there's been evidence for recent intense selection in the last 5,000 years for selection on genetic variants linked to lighter skin, skin pigmentation. So you know, that, that, that extreme selection tells you that they must have had darker skin previously. Otherwise, what is the phenotype that this selective pressure is, is acting upon? 
And this, this pigment, these pigmentation characteristics reflect the fact that, um, again, this population no longer exists in an, in an unadmixed form. And while they are to some extent ancestral to uh, populations who inhabit Europe and uh, typically inhabit Britain today, um, they are also, because of later admixtures and migrations, genet relatively genetically distant. So sort of to, to give you an example, uh, people who typically inhabit South Asia today are closer to living genetically to living people in Britain than living people in Britain are close genetically to the Mesolithic populations of Britain, if you see what I mean. Um, that's that's how sort of big the genetic distance is relatively in relative terms. After this, you have another uh, a number of other major genetic shifts that occur in Britain and the population of Britain through the Holocene. So 4000 BC, there's the arrival of Neolithic groups carrying this early European far farmer ancestry, which has a a uh, distant uh, connection to Neolithic populations of Anatolia, and this produces a 99% ancestry shift in Britain. Around 2500 BC, there's the arrival of Bell Beak associated groups carrying Western steppe herder ancestries, which are distantly descended from populations who lived on the Pontic Caspian steppe. Um, around 1000 BC, you then have arrivals of groups uh, probably coming from lots of different places, but with a, with a particular focus on southern France, which again produces about a 50% ancestry shift in southern Britain with a, a sort of a diminishing impact the further north and west that you go. And then there was a recent paper a couple of weeks ago that showed that uh, in the early medieval period, you have uh, groups arriving carrying ancestors from northern continental Europe, both from uh, probably Frankish parts of France, but also Anglo-Saxon parts of what is now uh, uh, Saxon parts of what is now uh, Germany. Uh, it, at least these are affecting, which, which produces a large ancestry shift in Eastern England as well, and shifts elsewhere, but you know, uh, attenuating, it's attenuating as you go further uh, west and north. And there's also another substantial shift that happens at some time between uh, 800 AD and the present day, which might be related to migrations to and interactions with groups from present day France. This is specifically in, uh, in, in, in what is now England. And the changes in pigmentation that have occurred between Cheddar Man and now has been a result of both these migrations where people carrying different uh, pigmentation genetics have um, migrated uh, into Britain, but also as a result of selection in Britain where um, there's been selective pressure for certain pigmentation characteristics um, very recently. Um, so there, going uh, coming up to modern DNA, is there a, a way that, that, that modern DNA can be used to define some uh, indigenous British population? Um, I mean, you know, the, the way that mod, uh, academic studies and uh, genetic ancestry testing companies produce these their source populations is by, there's lots of different ways of doing it, but usually they, they get people who either define themselves in, uh, in, the, in for the case of Britain as white British, or they had documented their great grandparents or grandparents come from a particular region. Um, and th this is a way of trying to get at genetic variation that existed in the past. But also these populations are trimmed algorithmically. So these are actually probably a conservative estimate of past genetic diversity. This excludes a significant minority proportion of people who would them define themselves and will be accepted um, as being um, white British. Um, so, um, you know, this isn't actually defining anything coherent, it's just a useful methodological practice of trying to get some sense of the genetic variation in a place back in time. It's not uh, in any way a useful way of um, defining who belongs in a particular place um, in, in, modern, um, in the modern world. Uh, and it's also in this context important to bear in mind that genealogical ancestry and genetic ancestry are not the same thing. Um, so this chart on the right hand side shows when you go back 15, gener uh, 17 generations, the red bars are all of your genealogical ancestors, the blue bars represent the proportion of those ancestors from whom you've inherited any DNA. So when you get back to a certain point, um, basically you inherit DNA in chunks and eventually get to the point where you have more genealogical, genealogical ancestors than you have chunks of DNA. When that happens, you essentially start to shed genetic ancestors, the genetic ancestors from whom you are genealogically descended, but from whom you have inherited uh, no DNA. Um, but because that from a probabilistic perspective, more of a genealogical ancestor, if, 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 your gen if your recent ancestors are from a particular part of the world, 
because then more of your genealogical ancestors will be from that will also have been from that part of the world even if you haven't inherited dna from them from a probabilistic perspective you're you will inherit more dna from ancestors in that region uh, and so will essentially your genetic ancestry will reflect the population history of the place where your recent ancestors uh, came from but um yeah the the the, the intuitive idea that your genetic ancestry somehow translates into some all encompassing um, idea of your genealogical ancestry is false. Um, and um, so all of this really um, um, pushes against this idea that, that there's, a, there's a straightforward way in which you can define indigenous populations of Britain in a way uh, through, through genetics, even if it, even if it was um, a morally, uh, ideologically, uh, sort of a desirable thing to do it, it's impossible despite this despite the, the change that there's been in the last uh, 10 years in terms of the vintage of british populations being reduced to uh essentially sort of uh, 18,000 years ago to you know less than 2,000 years to some extent uh people with far right leanings still um are persisting in using genetic genetic evidence and combining it with this sort of uh, indigenous dialogues to sort of define an indigenous people of Britain who are under threat, who should be afforded more rights than people who are not indigenous or are, um, um, in, 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 ver in various ways. And, you know, they, they, they can't let the genetics not fit. So essentially, they just change their ideas. Every time there's a new study come along, they just change their ideas to fit what is indigenous, because they start from the, the idea that there's an indigenous population of Britain who are the white people of Britain. And then they uh, sort of build the um the genetics into that um and again this is a just to say that the way that that, that, that sort of this these ind this indigenous discourse is misappropriated is dangerous because it can sound plausible to people and um often the way that the ancient dna results are received by the public and media are often interpreted aren't interpreted in these terms um and that's it for what i was going to say so hopefully that was interesting and not too uh, depressing. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Thomas. Now we will move on to our next panelist. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, and that was the perfect uh, background as well to the things I want to go and uh, talk about uh, in my talk. So uh, thank you for the invitation to speak uh, from the organisers. Um, I should say perhaps at the outset that indigeneity is not usually a concept that I bring to my research work, but it's been an inter interesting one to, to think about for the purposes of today's session. And all I'm really going to try and do in my paper is just to present a few ideas um, more linked to, to the discourse of indigeneity than, than to anything else to hopefully prompt a discussion uh, afterwards. Okay, so I thought I'd start out with some maps. Um, so these maps show uh, population uh, change in Britain and Ireland over time, and I think they represent the way that uh, many people in, in the public imagination tend to think about um, the, the history of Britain and Ireland um, via the kind of movement and arrival of various peoples, pushing peoples who were previously here back further north and, and, and further west. Uh, in fact, what we're seeing here is a map of the changing changes in squirrel population uh, over time, uh, with the arrival of the, the grey squirrels from the south and the east, pushing back the red squirrels uh, further north and west. Um, but this, this same kind of thinking uh, often underlies the presentation of history, particularly in the early Middle Ages. And if we just compare that uh, with this map, and I could have chosen any number of maps of this kind, this happened to be one, uh, in a historical atlas uh, on the bookshelf uh, in my office. Um, you can see the same kind of um, colouring in of the map of different groups coming from different places and pushing back uh, uh, other people it, it is prominent in the way that this uh, idea uh, is conceived. Now, of course, there are some crucial differences between squirrels and people. Uh, one of the key ones is that reds and grey squirrels are in fact different species, and so that they're not mutually compatible, they can't interbreed, and which is why they're, they're kept entirely separate. Um, people, of course, are not at all uh, like that. And um, uh, during this kind of period where we have uh, new groups of settlers coming from the, uh, the continent and bringing with them uh, a Germanic language, the process that was happening uh, within Britain was one uh, 
uh, of complex social, cultural and linguistic uh, change, rather than one of two mutually incompatible uh, species of squirrel butting up against each other and one pushing the other one back. Now, the, the reality of this period is, is very complicated and it's not really what we're going to be um, going into here. What we're talking about instead is the discourse surrounding this. So we'll be moving away from the, um, the, the complexities underlying uh, the kind of, these kind of social and cultural changes and considering really the, the way that they were thought about over quite a long uh, time period. So what discourse is it that I'm talking about? Well, this is the uh, idea that the uh, indigenous or original, I suppose, uh, in a sense, inhabitants of Britain are the, the Britons, which is the term used for essentially the Welsh and other closely related peoples, um, uh, rather than the uh, incoming Anglo-Saxon or English groups who displaced the Britons in major parts of lowland Britain. So uh, I think this is an idea which it's fair to say is, is very common and widespread uh, nowadays, and it has been uh, widespread for an awfully long time. I could have taken any number of um, kind of pithy examples of this uh, discourse to, to show to you, but um, just to, to uh, pick a few at random, really. We've got one, this passage from Gerald of Wales in the 12th century from his description of Wales, uh, where he articulates exactly this idea. Um, so he says that the Britons who were left alive, this is after the Anglo-Saxon invasion, took refuge in these parts in Wales when the Saxons first occupied the island, and they have never been completely subdued since, either by the English or the Normans. Those who retreated to the southern corner of the island could not continue their resistance, for their territory has no natural protection. It is called Cornwall after their leader, Corneus. There was a third group of Britons left unconquered, and these occupied Brittany in southern Gaul. So clearly Gerald is subscribing to the squirrel model of historical change in, in Britain. And, and if you think about the language of, of taking refuge and retreating, he's imagining two mutually incompatible groups of people where the, the, the grey uh, squirrel Anglo-Saxons are coming over and pushing back the red squirrel Britons uh, into the west uh, of the island. Um, this kind of idea really does continue for an awfully long time in this kind of form and as, as in Gerald's um, take here it's often combined with particular ideas about the legendary past of Britain uh, arising in particular from the very influential work of Geoffrey of Monmouth. Uh, written in this same century. So just fast forwarding to the 16th century, uh, we have the same idea exactly articulated in Humphrey Lloyd's work on the history of Wales, Chronicle Walliae, uh, finished in 1559, uh, where he's, he's describing the, the kind of essentially prehistoric past of Britain based on, on, the, on the ideas of legendary history that Geoffrey Monmouth was responsible for. And he ends by saying that uh, they, this is the Welsh, have kept the same country and language 2,690 odd years without uh, mixture, commixture with any other nation, especially in North Wales, as it shall hereafter appear. So I think, I think he's quite nicely articulating here a, a discourse of indigeneity, the idea that people in Wales and particularly North Wales are really the, the original indigenous people who preserved this, this language and, and, and customs over a very long period of time. Now, as I mentioned earlier, this kind of idea um, is, I, I think, in one form or another, still quite uh, widespread in, 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 in popular imagination. But that isn't to say that this discourse hasn't changed and evolved over time, as, of course, uh, many other uh, ideas and concepts um, have. Um, so I want to spend the rest of this time thinking about how this kind of discourse in the Middle Ages differed, maybe, from what um, we might think about it today. So. Uh, one way in which, um, at least in, in the way that we can see it articulated, um, past uh, descriptions of this idea differed from what we might think of nowadays, is that the majority of um, descriptions of this kind of discourse from the past are being written by learned clerical elites who are steeped in Christian biblical history. And it's very much within that kind of intellectual framework that they are situating this type of discourse. So to illustrate what I mean by this, um, I've given you here a kind of summary of key points taken from quite a well-known 9th century work written in North Wales called Historia Britonum or History of the Britons. Um, this work goes to some pains to identify when the various peoples of Britain and Ireland 
arrived uh, here for the first time, um, although it does so within the framework of Christian history. So uh, within that framework, of course, nobody is indigenous in the sense that they've been there from the beginning because all people come from, uh, from Adam and, and from the patriarch. So everyone has to arrive somewhere for the first time. And so that's what sets people off, or set, set people off like, like the author of this work, wondering where, when it was then that certain peoples uh, arrived in Britain and Ireland. And the author comes up with this particular scheme where lo and behold, the Britons arrive first of all, and then quite neatly, each of the other peoples arrived in, arrives in successive uh, ages. Um, the author is dealing with a chronological scheme known as the Six Ages of the World, which was very popular and widespread um, during the Middle Ages, particularly because of, uh, of the work of um, St. Augustine, um, which divided world history essentially into six ages as defi defined by particular biblical epochs. Um, so here we have the Britons arriving in the Third Age, the Irish in the Fourth, the Picts in the Fifth, and the Sac Saxons, of course, last of all, uh, in the Sixth Age. And these various arrivals, the author tries to date by reference to particular events in biblical history or uh, in the history of, uh, of Rome. Um, and so you can see this, this is the, 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 the arrangement he comes up with, which I don't hopefully need to stress has absolutely nothing to do uh, with, with real prehistory. This is, this is a, uh, a, an attempt as, as a construction of the past um, based on what on, on the thinking of the time. And I suppose just to emphasize quite how um, uh, differently or how, um, how constructed this, this, this was, uh, we can compare this construction with um, uh, similar attempts uh, among the voluminous writings of early Ireland, where one finds a, a somewhat different arrangement. And depending on which version one reads, one can see the Irish arriving in Ireland first and the Britons then being portrayed as a kind of offshoot of one of the early uh, uh, groups arriving in Ireland. So, so there were very different ways of arranging the same kind of, um, uh, the same kind of ideas. Uh, another way in which this type of uh, scheme is clearly um, contrived is the way that we have here such different histories ascribed to the Britons and, and to the Picts. And the Picts um, were a, a people who lived in what is now essentially North Eastern, Eastern Scotland. Um, and they can be seen to appear in the historical, in the historical record during the, uh, the early centuries of the Christian era, during the Roman occupation of the south of the island. Now, when the foot Romans first arrived in Britain, they didn't distinguish between what we might call the indigenous inhabitants of the north and south of the island. They were just all Britons. But it's during the Roman occupation of lowland Britain that there emerges um, this perceived distinction between um, those people, those inhabitants of the Roman province of Britain who continued to think of themselves as Britons, and the people to the north who were not undergoing the kinds of cultural and social changes associated with the Roman Empire. And they came to be perceived as being different and were termed Picti in Latin, meaning, meaning painted people or Picts. Um, and this is really the, the origins of the idea that the Picts were, were a separate ethnic group from the Britons. And certainly by the ninth century, but by the time this author was working, um, there would have been no question um, amongst him and his contemporaries, that these were entirely separate peoples, even though that perception of difference only arose relatively recently uh, in the past. Okay, and then the last thing I want to just um, draw your attention to is the significance of, of naming for this discourse and the names carried by particularly important uh, places and, and especially the names of, of the islands concerned. Um, so just to talk, talk for a moment about the name of Britain. I, I think this is one area, again, where the, the discourse of, of uh, indigeneity, and in particular, the indigeneity of, of the Welsh or, or the Britons has very much changed over time. Because nowadays, um, Britain and indeed Britishness um, is its own uh, complex, which isn't linked directly to either Englishness or Welshness in any kind of simple way. There's a, there's a whole set of complex relationships which have emerged in much more recent centuries and which are not really the subject of this seminar. Um, but that was not really the case in the past, in the Middle Ages, and particularly the early Middle Ages, where the name of the island of Britain and also the, the term Britons was much more closely linked to the people that we now call the Welsh. And that is reflected in the way that the discourse of, uh, of the Britons being the original peoples of the island is presented. And to give you two contrasting ways in which this could be done here on the slide, um, firstly, we have a, a statement made by a, 
a Welsh author writing in Latin in the 13th century who's commenting on the name of the island. Um, this author says that whoever has read or known the history of the Britons, may he have understood that this name Brutus is a Trojan name, but one corrupted by the Latins. For in the language of the Trojans or of the Britons who derive their origins from the Trojans, he is not called Brutus, but Predus or Pudus, something that is understood properly up to this day. Britain, which draws its name from Brutus, is called Pradain by the Britons. So what the author is saying is that not only is the name of the island uh, derived from the name of, of the first leader of the Britons who arrived in Britain, Brutus, not only that, but also the Britons or the Welsh here preserve the original version of that name, because the Welsh word for Britain is Pradain, and according to this author, at least, and we should say that this is, this is not really true, but according to this author, this better reflects the original Trojan name that the Britons um, uh, brought with them uh, in the name of their leader. So in that sense, it, it's kind of doubly original. Um, a very different take uh, on, the, uh, on the name of the islands is found in a number of other sources from England and for, indeed from continental Europe across the Middle Ages. And a, an early manifestation of that is found in the Chronicle of the West Saxon nobleman Avalweil, writing in the 10th century. Avalweil comments that Britannia is now called Anglia or England because it's taking the name of the victors. And, and what he means by this is that because the, um, the English had succeeded in, in conquering and, and ruling over a large proportion of the island of Britain that, um, and, and vanquishing therefore the Britons, the island should no longer be called Britain, but instead it should be called England. Uh, of course, today, especially in places like Wales, um, there's a, that people are very keen to make a distinction between Britain uh, and, and England. Um, but this distinction is very much uh, elided in this, in this way of thinking um, uh, by Avalweard and, and many others like him, especially uh, in the Middle Ages, uh, where England is essentially a synonym for Britain. Indeed, England is, is the successor of Britain in that kind of sense. Okay, I'll, I'll stop there then, but hopefully I've given some, uh, some ideas that we can bring then to the discussion later on. Thanks very much. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks very much, Ben. And now we will move on to Professor Alex Wolf, who um, I made a mistake in the beginning. Uh, is from University of St. Andrews, not University of Glasgow. Sorry about that. And please take it away. That's okay. I know we all look the same from that distance. Um, Scotland looks very small on the map and we're all um, on top of each other. I don't actually have a PowerPoint, um, uh, I'm afraid, because uh, I was slightly worried about overlap. And so I wanted to keep myself flexible uh, uh, because Ben and I have very similar specializations. So I'll sort of follow on from where he uh, left off. You'll remember that he mentioned about the, the biblical model of history that dominated, uh, that dominated ideas of, of writing and scholarship and thinking about history. And of course, in that model, all human beings are descended from the three sons of Noah who survived the great flood. And so the first part of any national history required people to explain how their ancestors uh, got to where they are, their people are now from Mount Ararat in Armenia. So the first part of any history is going to be the journey from Armenia to the present. And that immediately destroys any ideas of indigeneity, uh, as we've heard from Ben. And this model is laid out in, in the book of Genesis in a section known as the Table of Nations, which it does explain for many of the nations in the Eastern Mediterranean and the Near East, how they all relate to different sons of Noah. And from this, it was possible to infer that all Europeans were descended from Japheth. Uh, and so we had then have this series of stories explaining how, as we've heard, the, the Britons were originally refugees from Troy, came via Italy and Southern France, the Picts came from Scythia, stopping off on their way at um, Poitou in, uh, in France, because that's called Pictavia in Latin and therefore must have the same origin by according to the etymology of, of, of medieval writers. And one of the, the, the factors in this idea of the spreading out of people, and particularly the, the sort of secondary colonization, once you have people fighting against each other, is what's known as providential history. The idea that a, a, a nation is rewarded with a, a prosperous land and country because it's, it's behaved well in the sight of God. And so to some extent, the, the taking of land was seen as showing that one had, to use a modern term, manifest destiny to own that land. 
Um, that, of course, comes to the biblical idea of the promised land of Canaan being given to the Israelites, even though they had uh, it already had occupants, the Canaanites. Of course, we now know that uh, Israelites are all descended from Canaanites, uh, but that's a story for geneticists, not for uh, writers of history. And um, so this model of providential history is one that people bore in mind. And so that even when people have been settled in a country for a long while, they didn't necessarily think of themselves as indigenous. And coming from the 10th century, uh, we have a poem, The Battle of Brunnenba, which is written into the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle in 937. Uh, it's, it's written slightly before that chronicler Athelweard, whom Ben ended up quoting. And it, it celebrates a great victory by the nascent English, the West Saxons and the Mercians, who are in the process of unifying the English into a single kingdom. And it, they're fighting off foreign invaders, principally the uh, Dublin Norse, led by King Olaf, and the Scots, led by King Constantine. Uh, and they're defending their homeland, and it's a great national victory. Yet even then, they don't make claims to indigeneity. So the very end of the, of the poem reads, there had not been on this island ever yet of the slaying of people before this by the sword's edge, as book tells us, or old wits, since from the east hither, Angles and Saxons came up over the broad ocean, seeking Britain, bold battlesmiths, defeating the Romans, noble, eager for glory, got a country. So even in this great epic of national defense, they're still saying, but we came from somewhere else as well. We were invaders, we won in a battle, just as these people did. And, and probably the, the message to be taken from that is that victory goes to them, those whom God blessed. They were given this land by God and the attempted invasion and conquest of it by the Hiberna Norse and by the Scots will come to nothing because God is not on their side. And so in that sense, indigeneity isn't important. In some ways, uh, that might be more problematic. The Canaanites were indigenous, supposedly, but they'd had lost God's mercy um, and God's grace, and therefore they lost their land. So indigeneity in itself is not an argument. And, and th these are the models taken for understanding the right to settle land right through the Middle Ages and, and to some extent into the early modern period. And since being asked to take part in this debate, I've been trying to think, well, well how and when did this change? And we do get some di um, discussions in, in, the, in the Enlightenment that seem to raise questions of indigeneity. And one in particular that Scottish historians often bring up and find quite entertaining, because it's so ludicrous, is an idea put forward by John Pinkerton in 1791. Pinkerton was an antiquarian who wrote a lot of things, most of them actually crazy, but uh, at the time he was not necessarily thought to be quite so, so mad as he is now. Uh, but he was very well thought of in circles of, of enlightenment thinking in Scotland at the time. And he argued that lowland Scots, the people who spoke the Scots language, which some people think is a dialect of English, so of course it's actually a completely separate language, it's just very closely related to English, that the, the speakers of the Scots language, the lowland Scots, were indigenous and that they were ethnically Germanic, going all the way back. He used the word Gothic rather than Germanic, but he meant what we call Germanic. And therefore they were sort of equal to the English. They had a long history and Gallic speaking Highlanders were recent arrivals from Ireland. Uh, and that the, the Picts had in fact been Gothic or Germanic speaking and had always been there. And what he was trying to do was to suggest that the Protestant, lowland, urbanized, mercantile culture of his part of Scotland was not the product of relatively recent transformation, which is what we think, in fact, what most historians up to Pinkerton's time thought, and that language shift away from Gaelic in the course of the later Middle Ages, but that he wanted to claim this was indigenous. And this seems to me to be something that does spring out of the Enlightenment world. And I'm trying to think about why indigeneity should become more significant to that point. Uh, it, it occurs to me that it's probably to some extent about ideas about sovereignty coming from the people. And that if sovereignty lies with the people, then the ordinary people and the land and the land and the people together make the polity. And that's not something that we would necessarily have seen at an earlier period. 
So going back to the central Middle Ages, the Regnum Scotorum, the Scottish kingdom, dominated a, a part of Britain that eventually was more or less coextensive with modern Scotland. But it was well known, certainly in the sort of 11th, 12th, 13th centuries, that the, the Scotty, the ethnic Scots, were only a, a relatively small portion of that population. Uh, varied over time, but, but about half the population, uh, say in the 13th century, the beginning of the 13th century would have been people who would have thought of themselves as Scots, spoken Gaelic, and it was their kingdom but there were lots of people who lived in that kingdom who were not Scots. So, for example, Adam of Dryborough, writing about the location of his own monastery, which is nowadays in the, in the Scottish borders, described it as in terra anglorum in regnum Scotorum, in England, in the Scottish kingdom. And this reflects a much wider view that you see very widely across uh, kingdoms and polities in the early and central Middle Ages. But it was taken for granted that large portions of the population, often the majority, did not belong to the ruling group who gave their name to the polity. Uh, so you see this worked out in Ireland in complex ideas about uh, base population groups and noble population groups within provincial kingdoms and so on. Uh, and these are, these are legitimized by differing descent patterns suggested to them or that they're linked to different uh, phases of invasion and colonization of Ireland in prehistory. But you see similar things elsewhere. You see this happening in a place like Saxony. And interestingly, in the uh, text from Norway uh, in, from the 13th century, we also see about a three tiered level of um, ethnic inter intervention. Uh, the Norwegian nobility and the local kings of Norway have been descended from two brothers called Nor and Gore, who had come from the far north. They'd suppressed a, a people who at that point were what we would call indigenous. We don't have their origin in the narrative. But then the kings of Norway as a national kingdom came from Sweden and had a different ethnic origin. And it was important to keep that ethnic origin distinct. They took wives from the descendants of Nor and Gore, but they themselves in the male line were a different group. And this kind of tiered idea of ethnic identity within polities is something very common in the ancient and medieval world. And, and that's why I think that the, 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 the emphasis on indigeneity is largely tied into Enlightenment uh, post-Reformation or perhaps even late Renaissance ideas about sovereignty being invested in the people and moving towards what we think of as romantic nationalist ideas of states, which brings us back neatly to uh, Thomas's points about Nick Griffin's approach. The idea that uh, was summed up neatly by the, the Nazis as um, ein Sprach, ein Volk, ein Stadt, uh, one language, one people, one state, is not an idea that would necessarily have, have made sense to the rulers of 13th century Scotland or um, 12th century Germany. These sorts of ideas are really ideas that only became possible once people began to think about expanding the franchise and having participatory um, democracy of some sort. And that's where I'll leave it.